Hi everyone and welcome. In this tutorial, we'll have a quick introduction to struts 2. We'll just have a conceptual introduction and the next set of tutorials will cover how we can actually write an application with struts 2. In the previous tutorial, we learned what an MVC is and we learned that it's actually an architectural pattern. One thing I'd like to highlight in this tutorial is the difference between a pattern and a framework. Now, what is an MVC pattern and how is it different from an MVC framework? Well, a pattern is a set of guidelines. So it talks about how we architect the application. It's a pattern of architecting the application. The framework, on the other hand, helps you to follow a particular pattern when you're actually building the application. So you're writing code. You would have to write some set of classes or some set of libraries for every application that follows a particular pattern. So in that case, a good practice would be to have a set of pre-built uh, classes or libraries that you would use whenever you implement a pattern. So that's the same thing for an MVC framework. An MVC framework has classes and libraries that would help you build applications using the MVC architecture pattern. So the first thing is that the pattern is a way you can architect your application and framework provides these foundation classes and libraries that help you if you choose to architect your application using such a pattern. So there are a couple of advantages of using frameworks. The first advantage is, as I said, if you are if you intend to develop a lot of applications using a particular pattern, you would have to write a lot of uh, common classes in every application. So if you have a framework ready, it helps you get started quickly. And then the second advantage is it leverages some of the best practices. If you use uh, you know, an MVC framework like Struts2, you would have to have a particular set of classes and a particular uh, you know, set of design constraints, which are actually helpful to you because the way the framework has been designed, it is considering a lot of real world experience and a lot of good advice. So if you follow the you know, guidelines laid down by a framework, uh, you can be sure that you are follow adhering to a lot of best practices in the industry. Okay, so this is a standard MVC diagram which we've been seeing all along and you should be sick of by now. We have a client talking to a controller. The controller talks to the model and the view is for rendering the output so that it's consumable by the client. Now, if you would design this kind of a model in a Java web application using servlets and JSPs, this would be a standard way to do that if we are building our own framework. We would have JSPs over here to address the view part of it. We would have business services to address the model part of it. And we would have servlets which act as controllers. And this is an MVC pattern. We are sticking to an MVC pattern because we are separating the controllers from the model from the view. But then, if you're designing a framework, you would have to think of isolating out all the common things that you would have to do every time you build a web application. Now, let's say somebody gave you the task of building a hundred MVC web applications. Uh, in that hypothetical situation, what would you do? You would not, you would not want to create all these three different modules from the scratch for each and every web application. You would like to have some common classes that you would use in every application. So that's a question. What if you had to build 100 web applications? You would have to design a framework that gets you started and gets you started quickly. Now let's see. I have a client over here and I have a clean slate. Now what would I do? What would the elements of a web MVC framework be if we had to design our own MVC framework. Let's say we don't have struts, we don't have struts too, we don't have any of those other stuff. You're building your own MVC framework. What would you do? The first assumption is that you have the business service classes already because MVC focuses on the interface with the business services. The business services could be anything. It could be related to the application and these could change from application to application. So you would not want to have anything related to the business service in your MVC framework. So the assumption you would make is that there are classes already that provide you the business services. You, it, it could either be class files or it could be a jar that you would add, but the assumption is that they're already there. So now with this assumption, what would your components of the MVC framework be? The first 
thing that you would do, the first step in our, uh, you know, the analogy in the previous tutorial was to get the client request parameters because that would be the first step in the processing, right? A client makes a request. Everything depends on the request parameters and the request URL. So my first module in my own MVC framework would be a module that handles these input parameters. Now, these input parameters could vary depending on the application itself, but the method in which the parameters are passed to the framework is the same. It would be either a get or a post or some standard request, and they are a standard ways in which parameters are passed. So I would have some kind of a common module over here, which handles those input parameters. It gets all the input parameters and have it with me ready. Now, these input parameters are actually helpful when I'm calling methods of this business service. So, you know, the input parameter could be um, get me the employee record for employee number 1234. So 1234 would be the input parameters and that 1234 value would have to be passed to a method on the business service because a business service method would be like get employee of ID and then that ID 1234 has to be passed over here. So what I would do is I would also have a class over here that picks up what I've collected over here. And then this class is the interface to all these different business services. So I take the input parameters over here and I pass it on to my common class over here so that these classes are not disturbed. And then this class is gonna take care of calling the right business service. Okay, so these two would be the first two components in my MVC framework. Now I have, you know, I have, I have a class that calls the right business service and then gets the data, you know, it passes the ID or whatever that this guy has taken and then it gets the raw data. Now that I have the raw data, I would write JSPs, which would be the view. Again, I cannot write any common JSPs because JSPs depend on the application. It depends on what you want to show and that has to be written every time a new web application is created. But then there are a few common things that I can actually take out. I can have tag libraries. These are standard controls and libraries that I would want to use for my JSPs in different uh, web applications. So these tag libraries would be something that I would want to isolate out uh, and uh, use it because I'm, use I'm developing 100 MVC web applications. I would not want to have you know, a lot of HTML code inside each of them. If I know that there are some standard uh, libraries that would be helpful for any web application, I would want to isolate them out. So this would be the next module in my MVC framework. And then finally, I would need something that orchestrates everything over here. I would need something that calls the right model, redirects to the right view, and displays the output. So that would be some module here that routes I would uh, have some XML configuration and then I would route depending on the request. If the client request is get user profile in the URL, then I call the right model which gets the user profile. If the client request is uh, change password, then I would call the model which does the change password and then redirect to the right JSP. So there is one routing module that's involved and then I would read from an XML file so I don't have to write this module every time. All I would have to do for each of my 100 web applications is configure using XML. And this guy is a common module which just picks up the XML and calls the right module. So the XML would be different for each web application, but then the modules would be the same. So this would be a initial design of my own MVC framework if I had to write an MVC framework. So this is very similar to what you would see in Struts2. Struts2 has identified all these problems and uh, the framework that Struts2 provides has all these different modules. We'll have a look at that now. So this is how a Struts2 uh, design would look like. You have what are called as interceptors. Interceptors is the, you know, it's the gateway. Once the client makes a request, it goes through what are called as struts2 interceptors. So the interceptors takes care of getting the user request parameters. So this is what we saw earlier. You need a module to get all the 
user request parameters. And then it has something called as an action class. This action class is where you would call all the different business service methods. And what Struts2 has done is it intelligently takes all these request parameters that the interceptor has caught and it makes it available in the action class so that when I call the business service methods, I have these parameters ready. So I don't have to fetch them every time. Struts2 makes it ready and available, so I don't have to worry about that. And then as far as the tag libraries are concerned, Struts2 provides some standard tag libraries that you can use inside your JSPs, and that simplifies a lot of effort. And then finally, it has a module that reads an XML. Yes, it is the Struts XML. You configure all your interactions in your Struts XML, and you can say, okay, for this URL, this action has this action class has to handle. For this URL, this action class has to handle the execution and so on. And you configure that in an XML file, and Struts provides a module that reads from that XML file and takes care of this interaction. So this is a brief overview of what the struts2 modules looks like. We're going to look at all these different modules in considerable detail in the next set of tutorials, but for now this should give you an idea. So having seen this, what would you have to do to write a struts2 application? You would not have to write interceptors, they're already taken care of. So your struts2 application would not have any code to get the request parameters from the user input. You don't have to worry about that. Interceptors handles it and makes it available over here as well. So this module is also available, the module that reads from the XML. So the first thing you would have to do is write the XML that this module reads from. And then the next thing is write your action classes that call the business service methods. Of course, this cannot be handled by Struts2 because only you can know what your business service methods are. So you would have to write a class that calls these business service methods. And then you can write JSPs that uses the struts tag libraries. So these are the three steps that you have to do to write your own struts application. Write the struts XML, write your action classes, and write the JSPs. So with this, you can write a full-fledged MVC application using struts2. So about struts2, it's an MVC framework that helps you design applications using the MVC pattern. It's on version two. There is a struts, which is version one, which is considerably different from struts two. So if you're familiar with struts one, you would have to do a little bit of learning to you know, learn the new concepts that has been introduced in struts two. And then finally, it gives us pre-built classes for MVC that we can use or extend. So in the next tutorial, we're gonna look at how we can set up our development environment to write applications using struts two.